that's the way I grow growed up and I know that growed is not a is not correct English but I indulge myself and allow myself to speak like we do around here uh, for my own pleasure so I don't want you to think that it's a sign that I don't know proper English I do I just don't care about it and I allow myself to talk how I want the calories the next time you watch one of these videos where somebody's building an elaborate shelter from natural resources I want you to ask yourself how many calories this person has to be burning in order to fuel their ability to do all of this unnecessary work in the first place where's all that food coming from where are all those calories coming from do you know how many calories you will burn building a huge big elaborate fort Welcome everybody to this brand spanking new show and this very first episode of the Practical Woodsman Podcast. It's a real pleasure to have you here. In this first episode, I'm going to set the stage for all future episodes by giving you a little introduction to myself, my reasons for creating the Practical Woodsman, and my intentions for the direction of this show. But we ain't just going to talk shop. I also want to have a discussion about the four basic types of quote-unquote bushcraft or quote-unquote survival content that I see when I look about the internet. I want to share my thoughts about them, and this will tie in pretty nicely to my entire purpose for coming up with the practical woodsman in the first place. Before we get started, let me make a couple of announcements. First of all, uh, in accompaniment, I reckon, with this new show, I have created an online community. And that community can be joined by going to thepracticalwoodsman.locals.com. Locals is spelled O L O C A L S. Another way you can join us over there is to uh, download the locals.com app from the App Store and then just search for The Practical Woodsman. Why did I choose to start my community on a platform that maybe a lot of you have never heard about? Well, because platforms like Facebook and those others really stink. And Locals is a really nice platform. I really like it. And uh, it will support the things I'm trying to do moving forward. If you're watching this right now on either YouTube or Rumble, then you know that the show is available in video format on both YouTube and Rumble. But my intention is for the show also to be uh, syndicated across all podcast platforms eventually and so maybe you're just listening to this and you don't know that it's available as a video now you do so why don't you subscribe to us there the the practical woodsman on both youtube and on rumble and then you'll get to see me out in the woods demonstrating things uh, showing off the woods showing off my time in the woods and things like that finally I'd like to dedicate the first episode of this show to a man named Ricardo Rick Nagualero and his family. I don't know the man, but I did enjoy watching his videos on YouTube very, very much, and he passed away not very long ago. Much too soon, and it hurt to learn that. I don't believe anybody has ever filmed interactions with the woods in a more effective way or a more beautiful way than Rick Nagualero did. What I really loved about his 
approach to the thing is that he didn't do a lot of talking out there. Instead, he chose to allow the woods themselves and just the images of what he was doing and experiencing in those videos to kind of do the talking for him. And by doing this, I feel like he come very, very close to allowing viewers to share the the real experience of what it was like out there or would have been like out there to be experiencing what Rick was experiencing in his videos. So it's no secret or wonder at all that I've tried to learn from Rick Naguilero's filming and editing style out in the woods and to uh, mimic it in ways in my own work. So there's no reason for anybody to come out later and say, oh, you're just ripping off Naguilero because I'm telling you right now <laughs> that he's inspired part of my approach to things. Nevertheless, my personality, from what I can tell, is completely different from Rick's, and so the practical woodsman has and will have a flavor entirely its own anyway. All right, on to the meat and taters of the show. I haven't been able to help but notice, as we've been doing the show so far, that you all sound kind of funny when you talk. Yeah, I've picked up on that. All of talk a little funny. And the reason for that is that I'm from Appalachia, the region where West Virginia, Kentucky, and southeastern Ohio all come together. And everybody outside of this region where I'm from all sound a little funny when they talk so now you know why I sound normal and all you folks sound a little strange it's all right I don't want you to beat yourselves up about it I find the way ins talk a little bit endearing and I'm sure everybody else does too, so it's nothing for you to be all self-conscious about moving forward. I just want to put your minds at ease that no matter how funny you sound, I love you and nothing to be self-conscious about. So yeah, I, I growed up or grew up deep in the Appalachian woods in the wilderness. And folks who have been following me and various other aspects of my other work for a while probably getting tired of hearing it but I share this particular detail of my life because it illustrates the nature of my background uh, pretty easily we did not have running water at home when I was growing up and I tell people that and they say oh now come on but it's true we got all of our water from a freshwater spring down over the hill now I ain't talking about a well I know when I say that, the first thing a lot of people think of <clears throat> is like a big deep well where water had to be drawn up or where we needed a pump to pump water up. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a naturally occurring hole in the ground, which was a freshwater spring, a naturally occurring freshwater spring. If you stuck your arm down in there, you could touch the bottom. Uh, but that was our water growing up. So one of my chores every evening for my whole life was to go down over the hill with a, a five-gallon five bucket, scoop enough water into that bucket, haul it up to the house to get us through the night and the next day. And as I got older, you know, by the way, a five-gallon bucket of water is tremendously heavy. I remember when I could only handle carrying one bucket but as I got older and stronger of course I started carrying up two buckets uh, but we used that water for everything we used it for uh, drinking we used it for cooking we used it for washing and then when I was about uh, 19 I moved away from home and the county finally run water out there <laughs> so I'm not kidding right, right after the, I moved um, county run water out there so that's the way it goes now we did have a well dug 
uh, it was about 2,000 feet deep. They had to go about 2,000 feet down before they hit water. We lived up on the top of the mountain. So they had to dig that well really deep, and uh, the water that they did get out of that well was so rusty, it was so full of iron, that we couldn't use it, couldn't wash in it, couldn't drink it for absolutely sure. Uh, so when we did get the well, the only, even after we did get the well, the only thing we could really use it for was flushing the commode and that sort of thing. My other chore every night was chopping firewood, having enough firewood chopped or gathered on the back stoop, again, to get us through the night and through the next day. That's the way I grow, growed up, and I know that growed is not, a, is not correct English, but I indulge myself and allow myself to speak like we do around here uh, for my own pleasure. So I don't want you to think that it's a sign that I don't know proper English. I do. I just don't care about it, and I allow myself to talk how I want that I'm comfortable with. Four basic types of bushcraft, quote unquote, and survival, quote unquote, content that I see on the internet. You might want to jot these down, or maybe you don't. But here are the four, the four basic kinds that I've noticed. Number one, a fixed location near a home. Number two, a fixed location near a vehicle. Number three, traveling real distances on foot. And number four, traveling real distances on foot, but only with the goal of getting from point A to point B as quickly as possible. And I'll give you an example of this. I backpacked down the bottom of Grand Canyon and I took a big whole backpack full of things. And I was prefer- prepared for any eventuality. I did this in a, uh, during a January. I was prepared for any emergency situation, any type of weather, everything. I was prepared. So uh, I'm walking down into Grand Canyon, prepared, taking my time taking in all the sights and sounds and you know really enjoying the experience the journey on my way down there and as I was on my way down there were these trail runners they just come running right past me carrying nothing wearing shorts this is in January so when you do Grand Canyon in January at least my experience was it was all snow covered and ice packed at the rim and then the temperature rises I think two degrees every thousand feet you drop so by about the time you get halfway down into Grand Canyon all the snow and ice is gone and the temperature has begun rising by the time you get down to the very bottom along the Colorado River you could be wearing shorts so you started off it was freezing temperatures by the time you get down Colorado River it's mid 60s you could be wearing shorts but I digress. My point is, is that me being completely prepared for any eventuality and carrying a MacGyver pack on my back on the way down into Grand Canyon, I was constantly being passed by these fellers wearing shorts, carrying nothing but a single water bottle. Now I had split the day, I had split the trip up into three days. So I, I had divided the, the trip up into three days. One day to get down to the bottom, one night at the bottom, spending the next day down at the bottom, spending the next night down at the bottom, and then on the third day coming out. These trail runners were doing the same route in one day, the whole thing. So that's what I'm talking about, traveling real distances on foot but with the goal of getting from point A to point B as quickly as possible. Now these were endurance type uh, people, uh, people doing endurance type exercise. 
but I mean before I went out to to uh, Grand Canyon to even do that I'd done all sorts of research all kinds of preparedness uh, read all sorts of things and was ready for any disaster or any type of emergency or anything like that any type of need I might have in the canyon I got out there here's just people in shorts wearing nothing else carrying a single bottle of water running the entire route down to the bottom and out back out again that I had divided up into three days and was carrying all this gear for now granted if any of those trail runners were to run into any trouble they'd be screwed but plenty of them must get away with this type of thing that it doesn't scare the rest of them off uh, I had a similar experience when I went out to backpack the entire Maryland portion of the AT the old Appalachian Trail back during uh, November I think it was and the temperatures were like 8 degrees it was freezing here again having divided this trip up into uh, I don't remember what it was 3 or 4 days 5 days maybe 4 nights and uh, got out there and uh, again trail runners passing us not carrying anything carrying like a bottle of water on a strap so the, there are those types of people doing the same thing I'm doing with a completely different approach a completely different purpose uh, with a completely different purpose in mind you know but let's repeat these four types one a fixed location near home two a fixed location near a vehicle three traveling real distances on foot and then four traveling real distances on foot but with only the goal of getting from point A to point B as quickly as possible I mentioned these four basic types because most of the bushcraft videos you see on YouTube and the internet are deceptive whether intentionally or unintentionally they paint false ideas in the minds of viewers by far the majority of the videos I see are designed to make you believe that people are truly in deep wilderness conditions far from their homes and vehicles while at the same time somehow allowing these same people in these supposed conditions to do things that only people who are not far from their homes or vehicles could accomplish for example you will see folks cooking up these really elaborate meals over fires in these quote unquote bushcraft videos you've seen them I'm sure and they're they look really great <laughs> these videos look really great they're cooking with eggs beef pork chicken or other cuts of meat you see them spreading butter in their fry pans you see them with all these condiments and different spices and all these things you know very elaborate you see them spreading butter over bread I'm talking real bread real fluffy fresh bread normal bread out there in this supposed quote unquote wilderness where they are filming these things now assuming that we're not talking about wintertime temperatures no higher than say 36 degrees or so that'd be 2 degrees Celsius what is the only explanation for how these people can have all this food out there around a campfire well it has to be kept refrigerated they did not go out and wrestle an elk to the ground that morning when you weren't looking right so where is all this food coming from and how are they keeping it fresh how are they keeping it from spoiling well there's only two possibilities one possibility is that their house is right up the hill right 
They walked straight from their house down to this spot in the woods and filmed it. Another very uh, strong possibility is that their house is still just up the hill, but they carried it down in a cooler. Let me show you what I mean. This type of cooler, right? I know that's what I do when I'm just going a half mile into the woods and I want to take meats and eggs and all these sorts of things, fresh uh, vegetables, and keep them all fresh. I carry something like this. And uh, this is the only possibility of what we're talking about here. Folks are carrying coolers into the quote-unquote wilderness where they're teaching you quote-unquote survival skills. At any rate, they're within walking distance to their home or a friend's home or a four-wheeler or a side-by-side -side, which is parked not far from a road. I reckon what I'm getting at here is you know, wilderness. <laughs> this idea of what is wilderness and what is not wilderness. I'll never forget when I was a kid I have a friend who's I, I'm still good friends with him his name's Mark but he lived in the in town and I lived out in the proper woods out in the deep forest and I was uh, visiting him in town one time and uh, we were playing in his backyard he said come on let's go back out here to the forest and I looked over at what he was talking about and it was like this strip of trees between his house and the house on the other side of the trees and it was so weird to me <laughs> that as a city boy he looked at that little patch of trees and considered that a forest to me that's not forest and the wilderness is not something that you can reach by driving a, a four wheel or two or just walking in 20 minutes to that's not wilderness it's not wilderness when in the back of your mind you say, if anything goes south here, I could just walk out and in 20 minutes or so be back home or be back in my car. A person, now, now I'm not saying that there's no validity to, to ex that experience. What I'm saying is that it's not wilderness. It's not backcountry. But let's assume that uh, these folks who are doing all this you know, quote-unquote wilderness cooking are carrying a cooler. Why don't they want you to see the ice cooler that they're keeping all this food in? Well, because that would spoil the illusion, right? The illusion that they are deep into any real wilderness uh, environment. You know, there is an exception to this. The exception is that any time you're out backpacking and say temperatures that are below 40 degrees Fahrenheit, that is to say 4 degrees Celsius, so temperature drops below 40 or 4 degrees Celsius, and at the same time the temperatures are above freezing. Well, you're, you're out in a refrigerator. You're out in nature's refrigerator. You can carry meats. I carry bacon and meats all the time in the conditions like that. But to reach wilderness and to carry those sorts of things, the fact that I'm going into real wilderness limits the amount of those things that I can carry even so because they're not light. These are not light things. So I think I, on this last excursion, I took a big uh, shoulder of pork, and I took bacon, and I took uh, turnip, a turnip, a tater, an onion, and some other things. But, you know, I can't pack enough stuff like that for five, six days. It, we're talking about a meal or two meals or maybe three meals with uh, leftovers in those sorts of conditions. 
and I, then I can still get into wilderness areas carrying that type of food and demonstrating those ty- that type of cooking but otherwise I have to supplement supplement these you know the shoulder of pork with some freeze dried meals some simpler things some packaged things uh, freeze dried is great because it's very light you just add water and those sorts of things but what I'm getting at here is that the the narrative or the story that is being presented in many of these quote unquote bushcraft things are deceptive you're watching them cook this big elaborate meal in what seems like wilderness well both things can't be true at the same time not in most cases they can't actually be in wilderness if they're cooking like that because what else goes into cooking something like that well it's not just the food it's the the pots and the pans that they're carrying how many of these videos do you see <laughs> where they're cooking they're frying things up in a a cast iron skillet how far do you think somebody can realistically carry a cast iron skillet along with all of this elaborate food well, not into the wilderness not into the proper wilderness so you have to have a little insight and uh, when you watch these videos of what's really going on there because they're presenting the illusion of one thing and you have to look beyond the illusion and understand just the realities that some of these things entail traveling any real distance at all on foot in real wilderness disallows carrying a big old cooler full of meat bread taters vegetables butter and all that stuff it's, it's not practical you can't get far with those sorts of loads and you can't get far carrying a cooler to travel any real distance at all on foot means packing essentials and being very very selective about the luxury items that you're going to take if you're going to take any luxury items at all you know what a luxury item is in a in a true wilderness backpack any chair of any sort is a luxury item yes even if you're taking uh, just a little foldable stool you know like tri tri footed stool that is a luxury item that's something that when the time comes to to go on a trip you have to decide do I want to carry that or am I more interested in the uh, pleasurable experience along the way there's a rule that I go by I don't remember where I heard it but it, it, I go by it it's uh, uh, an ounce is a pound an ounce is a pound so uh, basically what it means is that uh, you know y- you can carry a gallon of milk from your refrigerator to the kitchen table and you barely notice it but if you have to carry that gallon of milk from your refrigerator um, 16 blocks away to a friend's house you're going to be switching arms you're going to be having to stop and take breaks because that weight will catch up to you so that's where the rule an ounce for pound comes from every ounce just a couple miles into the woods especially when you're going up when you when you have a sense and descents ups and downs significant ups and downs in the backcountry on uneven terrain and in weather uh, every ounce is going to feel like a pound so that's that's the rule how about those perfectly cared for veggies that have somehow managed not to get beat up or squished in these quote unquote bushcraft and quote unquote survival videos how does that happen how do you get perfectly fresh vegetables that aren't beat up or smushed it happens in a nice cooler where everything can be kept cool and fresh and not risk getting smushed or beat up and again how about the fact that these folks are cooking in cast iron skillets it looks pretty I'll tell you it makes for a real nice video you see this campfire it's just picturesque ain't it and they've got the the spit over the top and they're turning a big old Thanksgiving turkey over top of the fire 
and right next to this 50 pound Thanksgiving turkey they got a, a full cast iron skillet and what are they drinking coffee out of stainless steel cups they've got everything there it's presenting an image of like rustic uh, deep woods wilderness living and it can't be that you can't have a cast iron skillet a five pound turkey fresh bread and vegetables and all this stuff vat of butter and at the same time be in deep wilderness the the two things contradict each other the two realities contradict each other and so the only explanation is that anybody doing that is not in deep wilderness they're not in the wilderness they're in that they're in that forest that my buddy when i was a kid was talking about more or less more or less and you know it's not just the uh, cast iron skillet you're, you're looking at multiple types of cooking pans and pots and utensils and uh, so again it's presenting an image it's presenting a narrative trying to get you to buy into a thing that is not real what does the fact that somebody is using a cast iron skillet on a campfire immediately tell you it should tell you that these people are not very far at all from either home or a vehicle whatever the case the person cooking with a cast iron skillet or many varieties of pots and pans is not in a truly remote area not truly not when you can just drive there or you can carry that sort of weight to where you're at carrying that sort of weight to where you're at if it's a half mile into the woods might not be a big deal but that is not really remote is it that can't be remote even somebody on a side-by-side a four-wheeler or a snowmobile is not many miles away from anywhere how is the only way a person gets to truly authentically remote areas in the wilderness on foot that's the only way that is the only way that you can get in reality you can get to truly remote back country so are you beginning to see why I say that these videos are deceptive either intentionally or unintentionally by nature they are deceptive so folks watch these videos and they imagine everything wrong especially if you're a city city folk you've not had any experience with the woods really or you know your experience with the woods is visiting the national parks or something like that painting romanticized pictures in your head of false realities again i'll say that these folks might be half a mile back in the woods but they are not in any way cut off from anything Believe me, if they're pulling out perfectly pre preserved cuts of meat to cook on a fire, their car is just far enough away that if they want to drive to a nearby gas station later on that evening and pick up a roll of Pringles and a can of pop, they can. The cooking they're doing out there in the woods is not as rustic and as wild as they're putting on. It just looks good for the camera why do we know that we know that because except for a very narrow window of season everything that they're cooking has to be kept in a cooler and every variety of cooking pot pan tongs spatulas and so forth that they're using are things that any chef in any restaurant in any major city would envy now let's talk about shelters for a second how about these really elaborate shelters? They look fantastic. I've seen the videos, I'm sure you have too. What about these elaborate shelters that you see people cutting down dozens of perfectly good live trees for? What practical purpose do these shelters and the demonstration of them serve? Well, they would argue that if you're in a survival situation, you need to know these things. You need to know how to build these shelters, right? But let's think about it for a little bit. Do you really need to know how to build those shelters? 
I would argue that these are just grown children playing out in the woods. That's the that's the purpose for the shelters that these folks are building. They look great on a video. I, I'm not arguing that. They do look cool. But they are pointless. They are pointless and impractical for any real life purpose. What practical purpose do these shelters and the demonstration of them serve? None whatsoever. So let's review again what the four basic types of you know, quote unquote woodsman or quote unquote bushcraft settings are that you usually see on these videos. Number one, a fixed location near home. Two, a fixed location near a vehicle. Number three, traveling real distances on foot. There's another name for that, by the way. We'll get to that in a second. Number four, traveling real distances on foot, but with only the goal of getting from point A to point B. Think of the Grand Canyon Trail Runners. Now, let me ask you this. Which one of these four we just mentioned is the only one that allows for you to experience true wilderness? Not just you, anybody. What's the only one of those? It's number three, traveling real distances on foot. And I told you number three has a name, and the name of that is wilderness backpacking. Wilderness backpacking, true wilderness backpacking, is the only form of backcountry activity that involves getting into truly remote areas that require bushcraft skills for real, that require bushcraft and survival skills for real. Now consider this, since the only way to get into truly remote areas is by foot, or that is to say backpacking, this naturally requires traveling great distances on foot, right? If you have to travel great distances on foot, what sorts of things does this naturally disallow? Well, for starters, it don't allow for elaborate shelters that take days or even weeks to make and that destroy the landscape. It does not allow for cast iron skillets. It does not allow for coolers. Now, you'll notice that I keep complaining about people who kill perfectly good trees. It's a real pet peeve of mine. When I was grow, growing up, um, it was understood between me and my brother and my father for sure that we were not to go around the woods just defacing and cutting trees. Uh, my father was very particular about that. And it's a value that I have grown up to adopt myself. And when I see these folks, these quote-unquote bushcrafters and quote-unquote survival guys demonstrating these in completely pointless techniques and shelters out in the woods and they've cut down I'm not kidding you no less than 50 perfectly good live trees to build something that is going to serve as a YouTube video and then never be used again it really puts a hair in my biscuit I don't like it and uh, there, there's there's a group of bushcrafters. I don't want to uh, spit on anybody's reputation or anything on the web. They'll be doing their thing. I'll be doing my thing. But uh, they are very, very popular. And they live not too far from here. Uh, the main guy lives not too far from me. And I've been to his place. And I've met these, these other fellers who work with him. These fellers who, who work with him... Uh, they're kind of the worst of the bunch because they're not even from around these areas. They, they did not grow up in this sort of environment. And um, they come to his place and they do these demonstrations in his woods and almost every one of them involves them cutting down perfectly good trees. And they argue that, no, there's nothing wrong with it. Well, it's fine. They, they live on um, the, the guy I'm, I'm referring to lives on the edge of like a wilderness preserve and I know they're going into that wilderness preserve and just cutting the trees up for their YouTube videos and it really irks me many of those th 
those shelters are pointless when you can just buy a tent and pack a tent along and you know why would you go into the wilderness without a shelter of some sort anyway unless you're just a complete idiot so they're demonstrating things that you only need if you're an idiot um, because otherwise you'd be prepared when you went into the woods you wouldn't go into the woods without certain things right you wouldn't go into the woods without a flashlight some way to start fire some shelter something to carry water in these are basics Uh, but one of their key instructional uh, models is to say you don't need a shelter we'll just come in I'll show you we'll just build a shelter we get in the woods totally impractical when you give it any thought at all but I'm getting kind of off on a tangent I, I wanted to explain to you that I do not endorse cutting down perfectly good trees plural I can understand that if you're in a you know a million acres of wilderness how cutting down a single sapling is not going to be the end of the world especially when there's not you know a million people visiting that area I wouldn't want you to do that in Yosemite you know why because five million people visit Yosemite or something like that every year imagine five million people cutting down one sapling every time they go to Yosemite you see so in that environment I would absolutely be against it if you're out in the middle of true wilderness thousands of acres of true wilderness where only a few people a year are even in that area and you want to cut down a single sapling to pitch the middle of your tent or something like that I I can understand that what I cannot understand and I cannot get behind or support are these folks who think who are trying to teach you to go into areas like that and cut down 50 trees to build a shelter for one night that you're going to leave behind and never use again why because you're you're on foot remember that's the only way to get to a true wilderness area is you're on foot you, it involves travel it doesn't involve going to a place staying there for a week it involves going there spending the night packing up the next day and moving on so you i hope you're beginning to see why these people on the internet cutting down perfectly live trees are are not friends of the environment they're not friends of of uh, the woods of the back country of mother nature they're 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 youtube hacks is what they are so we talked about how wilderness backpacking or traveling on foot is the only way to reach true wilderness and that does not allow for elaborate shelters that take days to make that destroy the landscape doesn't allow for cast iron skills and things like that interestingly enough when I think of being prepared and conditioned for any true survival situation of the four types of bushcraft and quote unquote survival you see being demonstrated out there which one do you reckon comes the closest to mimicking and preparing you for a true survival scenario is it one working from a fixed location near your home two a fixed location near a vehicle three traveling real distances on foot hint hint or four doing that but with the only only the goal of getting from point a to point b as quickly as possible like grand canyon trail runners well the answer is number three it's wilderness backpacking wilderness backpacking is the only way to get into deep true wilderness and be able to put skills to use for real so while i sometimes enjoy seeing the creativity of people building elaborate shelters on youtube the i do so with the full knowledge that those things are a complete waste of time i'm just watching children build pillow forts that they're just children grown children playing out in the woods they're they're not teaching me anything they are utterly pointless they're a complete waste of time they pointlessly destroy the woods 
Think about the fact, I always think about this when I see these people building these these grown children, some of them 50, 60 years old, building these forts out in the woods, these big elaborate forts. Think about the fact that none of that wood is treated. How long do you wreck in a shelter that you spent three weeks making and destroying a bunch of perfectly good trees for is going to last? What is the purpose of it to begin with? Survival? Are you kidding? Remember these elaborate quote-unquote survival shelters you see these people building are not miles back in the middle of true wilderness. How do we know that? What's the only way to get to true wilderness? By foot, over many miles. So this person you're watching go back to the same location for three weeks, day after day, building his shelter, is not in remote wilderness. He can't be. Not when he's there every day for three weeks, running and going back home every night. He's not hiking 10 miles into this place. He's not. I'm guessing at most we're talking about a spot he picked out in the woods that's maybe a half mile, maybe a, maybe a mile from the main house, from the house that he actually lives in. They just own property, and he goes back on the property and builds this elaborate shelter. At any, No matter what the case is, it, it's, it does nothing good for you in any real scenario. Now, back to the fact that this person is spending tons and tons of energy, time and attention cutting down all the nearby natural resources doing a cost benefit analysis you can see I hope that the cost is very high what's the cost well the cost is time energy resources calories but what's the benefit the benefit is a cool YouTube video that might generate a bunch of likes but what will be the lifespan of that shelter just guessing because we're just talking about natural materials just picked up or sawed down right there in the woods uh, I'm guessing five four or five years maybe maybe so my question is if a person is going to put so much effort and time and energy into something that is not in the wilderness it's just out in the woods behind their house why wouldn't you just go to the lumber store invest in treated lumber haul it out there and build the thing properly with proper materials right haul it out there build the thing properly and have a shelter that will last 15 to 20 years wouldn't that make more sense if you're going to invest all that time and energy into building something in the woods and you're not in the wilderness and you're just walking a half mile back why does it need to be out of why does it need to be an inferior but cooler looking thing I would rather have a less cool looking thing that is more practical and will last you know decades longer than this thing I'm just putting all my energy and time and attention in that's only going to last for four or five years just go to the lumber yard use real materials but they're not doing that because it doesn't look as cool it won't generate as many YouTube likes and what's the other reason it doesn't play into the illusion the deception that they are aiming for the deception being that this is out in the middle of nowhere this is out in the wilderness nobody could ever stumble upon this thing it's out in the middle of nowhere and we know that's not true furthermore what skill have you learned or put to use after building this big elaborate clubhouse that's going to help you in any real world scenario so please describe for me a real life scenario where you're going to be in a survival situation that requires you to build some big elaborate fort that takes multiple days or weeks to construct and that you can't take with you when if you ever travel anywhere 
So, you know, in a in a real life survival scenario, you would need to be on the move. And yet you're going to tell me that you're going to spend days or even weeks building something that looks really pretty for a YouTube video that you that's going to do you absolutely no good anywhere else except for right there in the middle of where your plane went down in the in the Swiss Alps. That's what you're telling me. You're going to go down on an airplane in the Swiss Alps and you're going to spend the next three weeks building a big, elaborate, beautiful shelter, cool-looking shelter that you can't transport with you anywhere. And you've got no food. And yet you're going to build some big, dumb, elaborate shelter. Let's talk about calories. The next time you watch one of these videos where somebody's building an elaborate shelter from natural resources, I want you to ask yourself how many calories this person has to be burning in order to fuel their ability to do all of this unnecessary work in the first place. Where's all that food coming from? Where are all those calories coming from? Do you know how many calories you will burn building a huge, big, elaborate fort? That's another reason we know that these people are not out in the middle of the wilderness. Because they're not suffering for calories, are they? Where, where are they finding the time to go out and secure all of their food for the day to fuel their bodies while at the same time having time to build this elaborate shelter every day for days and weeks on end? I'll tell you where they're getting their calories to build these shelters. McDonald's. Yes, McDonald's and Burger King. They're going to McDonald's and Burger King in between takes. Now, could they be doing that if these shelters you're watching them build are truly out in the middle of nowhere, out in the middle of proper wilderness? The answer is no. But you have to ask yourself, if I were to build an elaborate shelter like that in a true survival situation, Where would I get the calories for it? Right? Something to think about. Maybe a lot of people don't think about. You're not going to have access to those sorts of calories. You're not going to have time to build such a thing. Not when you have to go searching for calories every day. You're not going to have the energy for building some big, dumb, really cool-looking YouTube shelter. And you're not going to want to stay in one place in any true survival scenario for any length of time that would justify putting that amount of time and effort into some big dumb elaborate YouTube shelter no what you're going to be is weak and tired hungry wanting to preserve your energy and maximize any effort in any way possible and to be mobile that's going to be more important to you than any cool shelter to show off on YouTube in a survival situation being mobile so this is what I'd like to ask yourself when you see videos on the internet that purport to be about quote unquote survival and quote unquote bushcraft which of the four bushcrafty type things is this necessarily based in what I'm seeing here what is this based in what does it have to be based in necessarily one a fixed location near the person's home two a fixed location near a vehicle Three, traveling real distances on foot. I will tell you now that the only one that makes any sort of sense whatsoever is number three. Everything else is just children building forts because they look cool and they tickle the imagination. Pillow forts is what they are by 40 and 50 year old men playing in the woods. Any practical approach to the woods must revolve, it must revolve, around the same concepts as wilderness backpacking. It's the only thing that makes sense. I remember watching one of YouTube's most popular quote-unquote bushcraft guys for years. This is the same person that that I was mentioning earlier, by the way, who who is a wonderful person. He is a wonderful person. I've met him several times. Real nice guy. But... So I don't want to paint the picture like I don't like the guy or anything like that. I'm just saying that he's he's making a living 
selling an illusion and selling really impractical ideas to people. But I remember watching him for years talk about how weight doesn't bother him. No. Weight don't bother him. He doesn't give it no mind. And he used to scoff at anybody worrying about weight. The weight that you got to carry on your back. Well, it's easy to talk that way, ain't it? When none of your videos are shot more than a single mile from your house. But now imagine for a second any real life sur survival scenario. Not only are you going to have to travel a mile on foot, but you may have to travel a hundred miles on foot up and down mountains while carrying everything you're carrying. But let's forget any real survival scenario for a second. Let's say you never go more than a mile into the woods. Then my question is, what need do you have to be doing these sorts of things anyway? Where are you ever going to be where you're ever going to need to do any of these things out of necessity anyway? And let me tell you something about that. It is impossible to evaluate the true value of any skill you learn until you are in a situation of real necessity. To give you an example, the skill of building a lean-to might seem awesome to you while you're a half mile back in the woods behind your house. When you know that at any time you get hungry enough, all you have to do is take a quick little jog through the woods back home to your refrigerator. Or how about if you get cold? You know, you go out in the woods, snowstorm out there. You're going to film a snowstorm. Do you understand that the person doing that knows at all times that they're never in any danger? No matter how bad things get, they know that they can just turn the camera off and be back home standing next to the stove. So I'll say it again, it's not until you are in a true situation of necessity where you discover that building a lean-to might not be worth your time after all, or that you'd rather just huddle under your jacket and preserve all that energy and time that it would take to build a lean-to. There have been situations where not even building a fire was worth my time and energy. What was worth m more worth my time and energy was simply getting out of the wind and under some sort of blanket or down bag. How much value do you think building an elaborate underground bunker is going to have to you when all you're wishing for is something substantial to eat and fresh dry clothes? I will tell you big elaborate cool looking underground bunker will have zero value to you lying down under a rock outcrop or underneath the branches of a tree will have lots more value to you so I reckon that'd be the takeaway point from this episode it's impossible to evaluate the true value of any skill you learn until you're in a situation of real necessity how do you get into a situation of real necessity. Well, it can't be achieved in one's backyard. And it can't be achieved by a 20 minute walk off a main road or by driving up to some location on a four wheeler. It just can't. Real necessity can only occur by being cut off for real from all of those resources and truly being dependent on yourself and the tools that you happen to have with you. I can't tell you how many times I've been truly cut off from the outside world, out in the middle of nowhere for real, and I have a need, and the memory of somebody famous on the internet demonstrating a thing comes to my mind, and I look at the situation in, uh, that I'm in, and I say to myself, there is no way that that is going to serve me any use 
in this situation whatsoever. The energy that I would have to devote to that or the time that it would take is completely ridiculous. It's pointless. It's utterly pointless and useless in this real world scenario. It probably would work fine if I wanted to put that sort of work, energy, and time into the thing, but real life circumstances say that that is completely pointless. It's absurd. So, now you should have an idea of what caused me to create the practical woodsman. It's an opportunity for me to share my love of the wilderness with you, and it's also a forum for me to highlight so many of the really flashy things I see around the internet and allow me to provide context for you that those people aren't giving you. These quote unquote bush crafters are not giving you and are purposefully leaving out <laughs> because uh, it takes away from the narrative that they're trying to pre present to you. The practical woodsman is an opportunity for me to highlight things that are practical and therefore useful as well as things that are completely impractical like elaborate forts in the woods and therefore pointless there's three different types of show I'm going to be sharing on the practical woodsman YouTube and rumble channels number one is adventures these will be videos of full excursions so you'll get to see me out in the woods suffering and doing things and enjoying the woods like I do showing off certain meals that I'm cooking and stuff like that certain gear that I use uh, number two is shorts so video shorts and these will usually be like spontaneous discussions about gear I'll try to keep them at around 30 minutes long, something like that. Other things I want to show off or talk about in a video format. And then there will be this, the Practical Woodsman Podcast. I'm going to label that as Episodes. So you'll have Adventures, Shorts, and Episodes. Episodes will be the podcast, and it will be available not only as a video here on YouTube and Rumble, but also as an audio-only uh, format and hopefully after well here soon that will be uh, sent out to every major podcast platform that exists and uh, our listenership and our viewership will grow as we continue to do these shows I'm not sure about the frequency that the podcast episodes will be uh, released in maybe once a week maybe twice a week but they will be regularly uh, published. I can't say the word regularly. Uh, people who follow other work that I do know that already. But now you know it too. Folks, thanks for joining me for this very first and very special episode of The Practical Woodsman. I hope you enjoyed it. And I uh, hope you guys uh, are doing well out there. I hope you'll join me the next for the next episode of this show. Take care.